want to talk about the passionate marriage. So if we can light that up, so I know where I'm going, the passionate marriage. But when you think of the passionate marriage, what do you think of? You don't have to shout it out, but, but think about it. What do you think of when you hear the words, the passionate marriage? Sex? Ooh, gosh. Okay. I don't know who said that, but it's a little early. <laughs> Well, we get all sorts of ideas of what it is, but I'm going to tell you what I think it is. And interestingly enough, passion defined is the ability to sustain enthusiasm and commitment in the face of adversity. That's how I define the passionate marriage. Isn't this kind of how we also define our faith? I had a call the other night. Uh, I don't know if you were listening. I think it was actually uh, Thursday night. And a guy called and said, I've lost everything. I've lost my job, I've lost my house. He went on with this list of I've lost, I've lost, I've lost. And I said, well, why did you tune in? And he says, I don't know, I was just tuning around the dial looking for some sports or something like this. He says, but I've lost everything. This is really about what marriage is. And for those of you who have been married for longer than like a month, you're going to discover that (laughs) it, it takes some work to stay married and to stay passionate. Let me describe first what I think passion is not. Passion is not the Hollywood romance. Relationships and marriages begun in Hollywood bliss, you know, that, oh, I can't sleep, I can't think of anything else, that that that's where they stay, they fail. They, They don't work because that kind of passion is too difficult, that kind of intensity is too difficult to sustain. And what happens for some people if they have that wild, crazy, you know, this is everything, kind of feeling is at some point when they wake up to real life, like they have to go get a job, they have to buy groceries, they have to pay bills, they have to raise kids, they feel like they're not in love anymore because they don't feel that same kind of feeling. And so it's very actually healthy to get beyond that wild, crazy, thoughtless, mad, wild love to say, hey, this isn't what passion is. Passion is really about what do we do with our relationships when life is tough? Some sad statistics. Chances of divorce in first marriages over a 40-year period is 67%. Half of divorces occur during the first seven years. And studies have shown second marriages fare even worse by about 10%. Clearly, being married isn't one of those experiences that we get better at if we go from one marriage to the next. We actually don't. Third marriages the divorce rate is even higher. You wonder why. The reality is because we don't really learn the lessons that we need to in the first and should be the only marriage that we have. And so people say, well, I'm pretty unhappy, so I'm going to move on to the next relationship. But the reality is we don't learn the lessons. You know, God says, learn them right where you are, right where you need to be, as you can learn everything necessary to have a happy and a joyful marriage. The majority of single-parent, female-headed families live in poverty, regardless of whether the mother works. 55% of children who live in single-parent, mother-only families are poor, compared with only 10% of children in two-parent families. The numbers, I could go on and on and on, the statistics, how much better we thrive when our marriages are intact and are joyful. So the reason why I talk about passion the passionate marriages, because, again, I'm not talking about the feeling. I'm talking about the enthusiasm that we can have, that God gives us. He gives us all the skills necessary to really have a healthy relationship. We live, well, I have this slide here, but we live about four years longer, literally, if we have a happy marriage versus if we're divorced or unhappily married. The numbers, the research that shows you know, people who are sick, who are overcoming cancer, on and on and on. If we have a happy, healthy relationship, we thrive. Uh, I always say, you know, whose advice do we follow? Anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. Don't run from suffering. Embrace it. Follow me, and I'll show you how. Self-help is no help at all. Self-sacrifice is my way to finding yourself your true self. That's what God says, self-sacrifice. All right, why save the marriage? Well, a lot of reasons. One, God says, I hate divorce. Most people who have been divorced say, I hate divorce. There's a lot of reasons to save a marriage. Uh, But uh, oftentimes we jump to conclusions. You know, as a therapist, most people come in to see me because they go, Joe, we're at the end of the rope. We have nowhere to go. We're done. We don't, you know. And what I find interesting, as soon as you can restore just a little bit of help, a little bit of insight, a few steps to follow, people go, oh, maybe it's possible again. 
And so often when we're really struggling, this is where we are. There is no hope. I don't know how to go on or everything else. But it doesn't take a lot for us to restore hope. There is happiness ahead. We may not see these ideas clearly right now, but uh, a study conducted at the University of Michigan found that people who are happily married live longer and are healthier lives than those who are divorced or unhappily married. They found that unhappily married couples are 35% more likely to get sick. And again, healthy marriage adds years to our life, literally. I say forget the broccoli and the exercise, work on your relationship, <laughs> and you're more likely to live longer and healthier. So there's a lot of reasons that we give for divorce. Maybe some of you have been divorced. You probably at least know people have been divorced. Certainly in my own family, I've seen divorce. And there's a lot of reasons people give. Financial stress, uh, infidelity, serious illness, conflict about child raising, difficulties with extended family. Remember what God said about this. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh, so they are no longer two, but one. I have worked with couples frequently, even Catholic couples, who theoretically know their faith, but they forget about this important concept, that the two, they leave their family of the origin, and they become one. I was actually very fortunate uh, kind of like Doug, I met my wife, we were high school sweethearts. She was a Baptist at the time, I was Catholic, and when we got engaged, her grandmother said, well, I guess I won't be seeing you in heaven, <laughs> I mean, to both of us. <laughs> but frequently, this is actually a significant problem. I, I've worked with couples who have been married for 20 years plus, and still the complaint is, well, when she gets upset, she goes to her family. Or when he gets mad at me, he goes back and hangs out with his brothers and sisters. And it's, it's not how God intended. The two are to become one, and we're to work out these difficulties together. There is one reason, though, that marriages fail. If you've li who's listened to the Joe Secor show? You know, this is great, because last year when I asked this question, four people raised their hand. <laughs> so we got together and had a little party afterwards. If there is one word, go ahead and shout it out. Why do marriages fail? If there's one word that we do, what is it? Oh, shoot, I can't understand any of you. <laughs> Pride? Communication? Don't pray? There's one word, and this has been researched. God is not in the marriage. All of these things are true is distance. 80% of marriages break up because people grow apart. They lose a sense of closeness and do not feel loved or appreciated. Now, of course, think about the things that you talked about. You know, they don't pray together, poor communication. All of these things just lead to distance. So ask yourself every day, what are you doing to close the gap? Life is always going to present difficulties. You're going, to you're going to face financial hardship, uh, illnesses, stress, worry, all these things that are going to conspire to drive you apart. But ask yourself, what are the things that we can do to bring ourselves together again, to make sure that we're keeping this oneness? Sure, mass, prayer. Prayer is one of the most intimate things that we can do as a couple. I know for actually, and I was born, raised, cradle Catholic, but to pray with my wife was really intimidating. <laughs> it was. It's like, uh, okay, let's do this together, you know. But it's, it's amazing because it's humbling, you know. It's very powerful. Okay, every time you criticize somebody, you condemn yourself. Just think about this. When we fight, what do we do? What are we thinking? We're thinking about how our spouse is blowing it, right? Well, again, Paul says in the Romans, and read the whole thing. Again, I'm, I, give, I paraphrase it. But when we're criticizing somebody else, particularly when we think in the context of marriage, we're condemning ourselves. We're hurting ourselves. Don't blame your spouse. It's frequent. It's natural. What do we do if we're getting in a fight? More often than not, who are we blaming if you're in a fight? You, 
right? It's not healthy. Don't blame yourself. Now, this happens less frequently where we blame ourselves for the problems in the relationship. It still doesn't help. Why? If we're blaming our spouse, if we're even blaming ourselves, which is done less often, we're not getting anywhere. We're not looking at solutions. This is called the fight. A lot of therapists, and again, maybe I stand alone in this. I haven't talked to Phil about this. I don't believe in the word fair fight. Therapists talk about this. They write books about this. We've got to learn how to fight fair. I just don't get it. And it's not because I don't read. It's not because I haven't gone to, gotten a graduate degree and everything else to study. I just don't think there's anything about a fair fight. I think if you're fighting, you've already blown it. Now, you can always talk about difficulty. Trust me, my wife brings up plenty of things that I'm doing wrong. We can talk about things that are wrong. I don't believe in sweeping problems under the rug. But if you're fighting, you've already moved away, I would say, from where God wants you to be. There is a way to talk about things where you come together and say, hey, we have got this problem. Or, hey, I don't feel loved when you do this right now. We're not fighting. We're talking about the problems. But with the idea that we're going to look for the solutions, and that's the most important thing. Instead, both people must assume responsibility for solutions. I've had, it's a great honor for me, and I know I've been on the other side of it too, where you work with people and they go, you're no good, I'm going to go find a better therapist. They look up Phil Sandoval's number. (laughs) But I think even therapists fall into this trap too, where we spend so much time talking about the problems, the problems, the problems. And what I have found is it rarely actually helps. Now, I'm all for defining the problem. What is the struggle? Where are you right now? But you have to define it and move on and talk about, okay, how do we move forward with this? I've never seen where people talking about the problems ad nauseum. You know, three years we've been in therapy. Well, what were the problems this week? You know, well, that's going to keep the therapist in business, but that doesn't help you. Did you like the program you just watched? Help Shalom World bring more programs like this to a global audience. Your support helps us share the peace of Christ with the world. Visit shalomworld.org forward slash donate. talking about hope. So let me ask, I can't, we don't have that many microphones, but let me ask, what do you hope for in life? What do you hope for? Say again. I hope for health. What do you hope for? That our kids love Jesus. That our kids love Jesus. What do you hope for? A happy marriage. A happy marriage. What are we hoping for? We're hoping for something, something different. We're hoping that our kids do something greater than, than what we're capable of doing or what we have achieved. We're hoping for most of us in this room that God will look at us and say, come on in, right? Ultimately, that's what we want for ourselves and for our children. The integrated circuit changed the face of the earth. And I'm on my show, I'm in my life all the time telling people, here's the difference between science and faith. And the greater two is not an integrated circuit. It's your faith. Your faith will help you to make an integrated circuit. It can't go the other way around, but sometimes it can. Sometimes technology will say, wow, that's amazing. And we'll get awe-inspired and we think, what else can I do? I hope I can do better. I hope I can make the next product that's going to make me a multi-billionaire. It's hope. We're at the altar. We say, I do. We hope that this is going to last. The baby comes, and we hope that that child is going to live a good life. Oftentimes, I'm asking people in premarital counseling, what do you want for your child? And they'll tell me all kinds of things. Well, I hope that they make money. I hope that they're healthy. I hope that they're this or that or whatever. But then when we start digging into it, what we really hope for our children is that they're resilient, is that when the inevitably, inevitable ups and downs of life come, especially the downs, we're going to be able to get back up. We're going to be able to take that punch no matter if we're six foot two or two foot six, right? We were made in God's image. And a good mother, a good grandmother will say, Mijito, you can do whatever you want. And God bless them. I can hear those voices in my head, Mijito, you can do whatever you want. 
My mother and father both Spanish-speaking people. That's not really true. I'm still waiting for somebody to offer me a shortstop position on the 8th. <laughs> Probably not going to happen. But what they're really telling me is, follow your heart. Go pursue what you want to do and make it happen with hard work. Don't worry that you're not as tall as the next guy, not as handsome as Joe Sikora. Don't worry about that stuff. Don't worry. We have to wrap skin around our hope. I hope that my children do well. I hope that my faith grows. I hope, I hope. But we have to wrap faith about it. Um, Father Matthew Spencer's here, and I was going to tease about the fact that I need to start charging them when they come on my show, because at one point in time, a year or so ago, Mother Miriam was on my show for a little while, and then she gets her own show. And, yeah. So Father Matt, so Father Matthew said to me, I said, Padre, I said, listen, brother, I know what's going to happen here. I, you know, I should get a little fee for this, right? <laughs> and of course, my beloved, my beloved, wonderful, wonderful man, Father Matthew says to me, okay, brother, you can get your fee, but you have to remember I took a vow of poverty. <laughs> I said, oh my gosh. But I can tell you, if Father really did have the opportunity to give me something I needed, he would do it because he's living his faith. And hope is part of that faith of ours. We have hope of tomorrow. We have hope. I'm going to shift this a little bit to the scientific community. The idea that if you listen to the show on a regular basis, I'm always quoting this study or that study, the Harvard Aging Study of Adult Development started in the 1920s, and it's been going on for about 70 years. And from that, we look at what is present when people age well and what is present when people age poorly. And hope is a fundamental aspect of this successful aging. We have hope that even if our marriages fail, even if our child isn't well, even if something happens, that we can get beyond that. Hope is a fundamental part of healing, that even in the medical community, we know that when patients have hope, when somebody comes and visits them, says a, says a prayer with them, just sits with them quietly, they have hope that somebody cares about them and they improve, medically improve, uh, more so than people that don't have hope. The idea that ch children going into, into college when they can express hope that they're going to get through college, they graduate at a statistically significant greater rate than children that don't, that don't have hope. So hope is real. The neurologists are beginning to show more and more where hope really does play an important role both in physical health and in achievement. We have hope that God's going to take care of us, huh? We have hope that when this life is done, we're going to be sitting in the hand of in the palm of God's hand, don't we? Maybe if I keep concentrated on this one focus, and this is important for what we call resiliency, maybe if I stop worrying about the next beating I'm, I'm going to get or the next meal that I'm going to get or the next, or when I'm going to get out of this prison, maybe if I start focusing on really doing what I can in the moment, that I will feel a little bit better. And we do. That's wrapping our skin around our hope, our prayers. That, yeah, I don't make this stuff up. I got a call from a friend of mine, a text this morning. And she says to me, she says, Philip, Philip, Philip. She says, I came home last night. And on the answering machine, my daughter had been committed to a mental health institution. She says, pray for us, pray for us, pray for us. And this woman turns to her faith every single time. Recently, I was going through some pretty serious stuff myself. And she was the one that comes to me and says, come, let's go pray together. Her and her husband, good people, design a computer chip. You're going to start with God. God gave us the blessing of the atom and the electron. Other things that we're just beginning to discover. Our hope in God is where the answers lies for everything. Whether we know how to do math or whether we are off the charts with an IQ. We wrap our skin around our hope. So one of the things about neurology is that the neurologists are telling us and the developmental theorists are telling us that hope is not just some abstract concept. So we all have faith in this room and we have hope, but it's not an abstract concept. In fact, the idea about wishing and hope are really easily delineated. 
Even in the brain, left side, right side brain, hope sits solidly in the right side of our brain, which says that we don't pretend that bad things are happening. Dr. George Valent will say to us, hope looks death squarely in the eye. We don't pretend that we might get divorced. We don't pretend that somebody might cheat on us or, or our kid may become a heroin addict. It happens, doesn't it? I know, I'm telling you right now in the group of population that we have right here, everything's happened. I guarantee if I walk around long enough, I'm gonna find somebody whose son is addicted to something or another. I'm gonna find somebody that's had this terrible thing happen in their life. Am I wrong? Joe said it, or somebody did when they were introduced to me, and I hear it all the time. I heard it about three or four times when we were walking in the hall. People write to me all the time, Phil, it helps. What helps? I'll tell you what helps. Being listened to helps. Having somebody say, my voice, it's amazing. They say, it just helps as a calm voice. I'm talking about the biggest storm of my life. My child is a heroin addict. My child is prostituting their body on the corner even though we live in a multi-million dollar house because their addiction is out of control. And I say to them, how can I help? And they don't know. They don't know. But I tell you what does help is we just listen to them. We embrace them. We say, we're here, brother and sister. Let me share my story with you. Let me tell you about my life. Let me tell you about this. Let me tell you about that. In the grand scheme of things, it is funny, and we get great kick, right? Humor is an adult coping mechanism, so humor is good. I'm glad we're using it today. But in the grand scheme of things, not going to make one difference in the world whether you're 6'2 or 5'6. It's not going to make one difference in the world whether you're male or female. What's going to make a difference is what you're hoping on. And so long as we're hoping on God, we're going to be okay. We may get fired. We may get sick, and we inevitably will die, right? What we worry about, what we hope for, is that when we come, when our time comes, whether it's in the middle of the peak of our career, look at Steve Jobs. I mean, the guy's a billionaire. Apparently did significant things to change the face of the earth and died, right? But what we fear is not death. What we fear is when we die, when we get to those gates of heaven, God's going to say to us, Philip, I've been waiting for you. Come on. You're worthy. What I worry about is, God, will I be worthy? God, don't let me stay in purgatory too long. <laughs> and God, just, okay, if I can't go right there, you know, don't let me go the opposite direction. Hope is abounding. Hope is the only thing that keeps us alive. <laughs> 